What's up? The Neptune File, a story of astronomical rivalry and the pioneers of planet hunting. Written by Tom Standage. That's his name right there. Now I was told by somebody, I can't remember who, it was probably my own dad, but if you can take a book and get at least one thing out of it that you never considered before, chances are the book was worth your time. If you can't get anything out of a book, then it was a complete waste of time. Fortunately, I got two things out of this book, and I think focusing on those two things is going to lead me to understand how science and astronomy is done these days. And the first thing is that uh, Herschel, Herschel was obsessed with looking for things in the sky and making telescopes. I'll go ahead and read this passage to you. At the time, this is on page 7, at the time he made his discovery, Herschel was living a double life, combining music with astronomy. His journal entries contain an old mixture of details of concerts, music lessons, and pupils one minute, and mirrors, glasses, putty, and star maps the next. He was obsessed. Every spare moment was devoted to polishing mirrors, building telescopes, and observing the heavens. Often he would return from a concert or a social occasion in Bath and go directly to his telescopes. As his sister Caroline noted in her memoirs, quote, Every leisure moment was eagerly snatched at for resuming some work which was in progress, without taking time for changing dress, and many a lace ruffle was torn or bespattered by molten pitch. I'm assuming that's what he used for a lot of the telescope making. It says here, Mirror making, in particular, was not a job for the half-hearted, since the mirror must be continuously polished for hours at a time in order to be free of imperfections. On one occasion, noted Caroline, quote, By way of keeping him alive, I was even obliged to feed him by putting the vitals by bits into his mouth. This was, op this was once the case when, at the finishing of a seven-foot mirror, he had not left his hands from it for sixteen hours altogether. He had, and in general... He was never unemployed at meals, but always at the same time contriving or making drawings of whatever came into his mind. And generally, I was obliged to, re to read to him when it's some work which required no thinking. One of Herschel's pupils, an actor named Bernard, recalled that one evening the sky began to clear in the middle of his music lesson. There it is at last, cried a jubilant Herschel to the bewilderment of his pupil, dropping his violin and rushing to the telescope to observe a particular star. Bernard also described Herschel's rooms where the lessons took place. Quote, his lodgings resembled an astronomer's much more than a musician's, being heaped up with globes, maps, telescopes, reflectors, under which his piano was hid, and a violoncello, like a discarded favorite, skulked away in a corner, end quote. All this is from an amateur astronomer. Herschel was technically an amateur astronomer. He was not employed by the king. Later on, I think he was employed, but he here was making these pretty badass telescopes using his own way of making them. And I learned later on that uh, a lot of the professional astronomers doubted him and considered him to be a crank for claiming that his telescopes have magnifying powers of up to 2,000. But, turns out he wasn't a crank. He was just a pretty badass anim amateur astronomer. He did what he loved to do for free. He was obsessed with his profession, regardless of if he was getting paid to do it. That's a very important lesson I need to tell my readers, tell my audience. It doesn't matter if somebody pays you to do something. Sure, it's professionalism. But if you love something, if you really like doing something, you're going to do it regardless of if somebody's paying you or not. And that is what your career is. Regardless of if you're getting paid for it. That's what I learned. Maybe you'll get lucky and be paid to pursue your career. But I've learned that a lot of people out there have careers that are just simply not paid for. Which is unfortunate. But it really doesn't mean anything if you're doing what you love what you love anyway so the second lesson was the kind of mentality that exists inside of astronomy and the prediction mentality where it came from 
I figured out where the prediction mentality of science came from. Science isn't about predicting things. It never was. It's just a hypothesis making where you state something, you do a test, and you try to disprove it. You try to disprove it. You try to disprove it. It's always a step-by-step -step process. It has nothing to do with prediction at all. But prediction somehow weaseled its way in there back in the 1700s. Here, I'll go ahead and read this passage. After an elliptical orbit had been worked out based on a handful of observations, its accuracy could be assessed by checking to see that it agreed with other observations of the planet, adjusting the ellipse if necessary. When an elliptical orbit had been derived that satisfactorily accounted for all previous observations, it could then be used to predict the future position of the planet against a celestial sphere as viewed from Earth. Subsequent observations could be made to check these predicted positions and ensure that the planet was following the expected path through the sky. Any discrepancy could be used to recalculate and refine the orbit further. Of course, he was talking about the planet Uranus. And this brings into light that math mathematics, you know, was used when ast with astronomy because, you know, you can measure them and you could calculate where they were and all this other stuff. But mathematics was used to try to predict the future position of a planet in the night sky. Okay, that's it. Because the object was obviously big, and you can, if it traveled on an ellipse, you could do mathematical formulas and try to figure it out from there. That was only really used for mathematics. But somehow, these days, the mathematics, they try to push as being somehow able to predict things. No. What happens is that you observe things first. You have to see it happen first, and then the math comes into play. And even then, even if you have a good math formula, as it goes over here, they were drawing up math formulas all over the place, but they still had to readjust because they had no idea where it was going, no matter how much math they used. So, that's the second uh, really good point. You can claim that math can be used to predict, but really, it doesn't mean anything unless you actually have observation. And that's one of the big problems I see with astronomy these days, is they think that math predicts. It doesn't. Observation happens, and then that's it. You can use the math after the fact. The horse comes before the cart, not the cart before the horse. Today is December 19th, 2015. Hopefully this helps people out a little bit.